I think we can start out this 10-minute segment by reminding you that infectious diseases are probably the single biggest cause of general inflammatory diseases. Probably the second biggest cause would be autoimmune diseases. So a uh, good principle is that if the antigens causing infection are coming from the outside of your body, that's infectious disease. If the antigens causing infection are from your intrinsic antigens, that's autoimmune disease. So all of the patterns that we talked about of inflammation in the second chapter are basically still uh, present here, aren't they? So we talked about uh, acute infection, chronic infection, subacute granulomatous, abscesses, fibrosis, blah, blah, blah. They apply here. And I would also like to remind you that it's not very likely that a specific type of organism will produce a very, very specific type of inflammatory reaction. What I mean is it'll generally fall into clusters. You may see... Um, abscesses in any type of infection. You may see granulomas in uh, many other types of infections, but uh, it's not very likely you could identify a specific organism just from looking at a specific pattern, anatomic pattern of inflammation. This is a good example. We'll call this acute appendicitis, and as you know, acute appendicitis is not really caused by a specific bacteria. It's generally caused by obstruction to blood flow and maybe secondary overgrowth of bacteria. But this could be any type of organism because it's basically neutrophils. You might want to call it uh, suppurative or um, purulent. Uh, and as you know, both uh, gram-positive, gram-negative, cocci, bacilli, even viruses can produce this type of pattern of inflammation. But Let's take a look at another thing which we saw before called an abscess. Okay, localized collection of uh, neutrophils, a bag of pus, virtually 100% neutrophils, maybe some fibrin, localized in one place. Could this be a bacteria? Could it be a virus? Could it be gram-negative, gram-positive? Could it be a uh, parasite? Could it be a protozoan? Yes, it could be. But I want to point out that... Uh, Patterns of inflammation are not specific, at least not really 100% specific. In some cases, like granulomas, you might be able to narrow it down in terms of what type of organism is infecting. Here is something which you might say, and you say, gee, this kind of looks like it's either organizing inflammation or maybe chronic inflammation because there's a lot of lymphocytes and macrophages here, but I see a lot of blood vessels, a lot of edema. Could this be uh, a suppurative or acute inflammation from anything which is now organizing? It certainly could be, uh, because uh, you might start be starting to see the entrance of perhaps some fibroblasts. Could it be the beginning of fibrosis? Yes, it could be. Here's another classical type of inflammatory reaction to a pathogen, and it's our old friend, the granuloma. Now, the neat thing about granulomas is that when you see this as a pattern of infection, you still know theoretically it could be due to anything. However, there are certain types of pathogens that classically cause granulomas, and it's not 100% uh, specific, but when you see a granuloma, you are generally most likely dealing with either a mycobacteria, a fungus. Uh, there's a whole bunch of scattered you know, bacteria and viruses that could cause granulomas as well. Or the cause of it might be a foreign body or sarcoidosis. sarcoidosis. So just kind of keep in the back of your mind that when you see granuloma, run down your mind real quickly, uh, TB, other uh, acid fast bacilli, a variety of fungi, uh, sarcoid or foreign bodies is the four common causes. And specifically with fungi, a fungus, whether it is a yeast fungus or a hyphal fungus or a superficial fungus or a deep fungus, is much more likely to produce a granulomatous pattern of reaction than any other type of infectious organism. 
Um, and there's a reason for that, and I'll probably get around to telling you someday. No, I think I'll tell you now. The reason why fungi cause granulomas is when you look at the pure size of the organism. Generally, uh, fungi, especially hyphae, are, are large. They're many, many times larger than viruses and bacteria. So as a result, not one single cell can easily deal with that. So uh, macrophages join up in groups to form these macrophage syncytia, some of which contain multiple nuclei in one cytoplasmic mass called the giant cell. And this is the body's mechanism for attacking pathogens, which are very large. And this is why fungi classically produce a granulomatous pattern of inflammation. Does this look uh, um, familiar? It might. You can see it's some type of glandular organism. Perhaps it's a pancreas. Perhaps it's a salivary gland. I don't know what it is. Well, you could see that there are little bands of uh, collagen entering in here, although you can still see the persistence of some probably mononucleated inflammatory cells. So this is early fibrosis. And as you know, fibrosis is generally the end stage of chronic inflammation. And it's still a nonspecific pattern. And just as nonspecific as fibrosis following chronic inflammation, you can have uh, the deposition of blood pigment or hemosiderin uh, picking up by macrophages to cause little brown granular pigments inside of macrophages. Or if you stain them with the Prussian blue dye, looking very, very, very blue. Just know that uh, uh, hemosiderin uh, deposition is also commonly part of a chronic inflammatory and even infectious process. Last but not least, very, very common in chronic fibrotic long stage uh, inflammatory processes is calcification. And calcium uh, often looks like a little shattered crystal, very, very dark blue. And if it's large enough, of course, may not, it usually is not in macrophages at all, is it? Okay. Uh, now that we have seen the general uh, histologic uh, patterns of uh, body reaction to the infectious organisms, let's talk about in more detail the uh, four biggies. You know, we went through a lot of uh, interesting things and prions and little viruses that infect bacteria, but in human diseases, the kind you'll be seeing, what are really the four biggies? Well, the four biggies of infectious disease are viruses, bacteria, fungi, and parasites. And we're going to spend a little bit more detailed time now zeroing in on some of the common patterns and some of the common diseases in each one of these uh, categories. We won't go into everything because we don't have the time. It's not worth it. And we'll probably be dealing with these more when we get into the uh, systemic diseases. But I think it's, uh, we wouldn't be doing you justice if we didn't start talking about some of the general patterns or classifications of these four different types of uh, pathogens. We can start out with viruses. There are four patterns of viral diseases. There's a transient acute clinical pattern, things that appear rapidly, perhaps go away rapidly, uh, nev perhaps never come back, like measles, mumps, polio, West Nile virus infection. There are the chronic latent viruses. Uh, many of them are in the herpes family, and some of these, like we said before, may give rise to neoplasms. So the general herpes family uh, of viruses uh, is a famous for causing chronic latent diseases, diseases which may reoccur many years later and come back and come back and maybe go away or maybe not go away. There are the chronic viruses which are generally associated with hepatitis and we have hepatitis going all the way up to E now, A, B, C, D, E. For practical purposes, hepatitis A, B, C are the ones we'll be zeroing in on. And uh, as you know, even though this is a chronic pattern, some of the chronic viruses, especially B and C, can also be indicted in liver tumors or transforming. And that's our fourth category of viral infections are the transforming viruses. So if you take the Epstein-Barr virus or EBV, 
deaths is very much indicted. In fact, the cause of a type of malignancy called Burkitt's lymphoma. It can also infect uh, tissue, including uh, hematopoietic tissue, uh, to cause uh, acute patterns of diseases too, like mononucleosis. We know the human papillomavirus, or HPV, uh, is a transforming virus. And uh, we'll be going into these four categories now. 